got uh, closer to my name the second time. That's very good. I'm Gus Schmedlin. Thank you. Um, I realize English may be challenging uh, to someone who's uh, run five or six schools. Uh, what I want to do today is, is really reemphasize and point out that we had a scholar, a futurist, and now a capitalist all saying the exact same thing. We're all saying that schools, education as we know it, needs to change to adapt to a uh, infinitely disrupted economy, infinitely disrupted life to become more flexible and adaptive. I have never seen so much alignment uh, in each of the um, approaches that have been uh, offered this morning. So we'll just go uh, through this. As Vinay said when he opened up the session today, we are uh, facing four mega trends that are driving the future. One of them is spelled incorrectly on the uh, lower right there. Um, rapid urbanization, changing demographics, hyperglobalization, and accelerated innovation. The last one, the one that's spelled incorrectly, is the one that's most important and most relevant to schooling. Uh, this, uh, watch as I step away and it still works. Uh, this slide shows you the three eras. Again, they were alluded to by, by Tony Wagner and again expertly by Brian. Brian, I haven't seen a beard that good since Shelley Blake Plock. Very, very nice. I love it. Uh, Brian uh, also mentioned Bernie Sanders and they're both from Vermont, so you probably do run into him uh, maybe at Ben and Jerry's. But what, what's striking to me is that uh, we're, we're really looking at the dawn of a new age. This age is either called the experience age or the creative age, but it's really where uh, humans have to become more than simple uh, cogs in a machine. Humans have to become creative thinkers if they want to survive and thrive in the new economy. Uh, also, as described by the people who spoke before me, uh, we have employment expectations that are changing, changing both from the employers in the new gig economy or the American economy if you're Australian, uh, but also from the uh, employees themselves. We know that it's just it's not one employer for, the, for their entire time anymore. Uh, we know that the, instead of top-down organizations that resemble the military, they're more uh, horizontal organizations. And uh, I still haven't, I've yet to meet someone that works 40 hours a week exactly in the same uh, location. It's anytime, anywhere work. And instead of a technical skills focus, it's really one on collaboration. It's really that uh, dependency on teams, uh, that wherever they are uh, in the world, uh, and that de dependency on working together to solve a common goal. We also have to worry about this person or this non-person, as the case may be. Artificial intelligence and automation will profoundly change the world. Uh, will this lead to creative destruction? Uh, will this lead to <laughs> mass chaos, like uh, you described in some of your slides? We don't know. We do know that it will certainly disrupt the basic service industries. It will disrupt manufacturing and distribution, and it will disrupt education and training. When used for the right purposes, automation can provide uh, predictive analytics for students to help them you know, understand uh, algebra or calculus and keep them on the right track. Uh, when used for bad purposes, it can do things like replace teachers or replace the human uh, the humanity in education, the, the ins insurance that students will become uh, good citizens, uh, not robots themselves. From a creative destruction, destruction standpoint, we know that industries will change and we should be happy uh, or at least uh, feel less anxious that since the Industrial Revolution and even before that, as industries were disrupted, uh, as this uh, disruptive innovation has taken over industries, humans have survived. We have an uncanny knack uh, to do that. So my prediction uh, is that this creative destruction will lead to new jobs, new opportunities, uh, and a more peaceful, prosperous world. The other thing that we're seeing, and you'll see it all over uh, the expo floor out there, and you'll see it uh, in a number of different uh, research uh, programs that we're running across the world, uh, is the rise of XR. Augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, blended reality, 3D printing, et cetera. And we're finally seeing it becoming accessible from a cost perspective, and we're finally seeing that content, both in AR, like the holographic anatomy curriculum that's being developed by Case Western Reserve University in Ohio in the United States, and also VR, to be able to train doctors how to operate without operating on live patients, to train ship captains how to steer a boat while not being near the sea and all of the expense that's incurred and uh, so forth. So training, education, and even building empathy um, at a project at Brown University, we're working with uh, a professor there to use VR to establish empathy between cultures that may not agree or see eye to eye on a number of issues. We also have this thing called 3D printing. 
To you, designers and engineers, captains of industry and leaders of thought, anyone whose ambitions have ever exceeded what was possible, this is your moment, your rewrite history, the world is not flat moment. Every facet of how you design and manufacture is about to be reinvented. And it all starts here with the smallest of building blocks, the mighty HP Voxel. You and it are about to change the world by advancing radical prototyping, accelerating manufacturing, and taking precision and strength to unheard of heights. From today forward, the 3D printer is a factory for thought, where the things we make will make us smarter, better, more human. What a future we'll create with new materials and embedded intelligence. Together, we'll bring extraordinary to the everyday and reality to dreams light years away. Welcome to the age of digital production, on demand, a world without waste, without inventory, without warehouses. Meet the first HP Jet Fusion 3D printers, the digital furnaces of the next industrial revolution. Join us as we engineer the never before voxel by voxel. HP Multi Jet Fusion. Keep reinventing. And if we want to talk about uh, patents uh, and, and intellectual property that's conveyed to students, that's it. It's, it's 3D printing, it's these artifacts that are uh, going to reinvent supply chains that will reinvent the way that we distribute goods, the, the way that we reinvent uh, what finished goods inventory is defined as. So uh, we know that XR, including 3D printing, will profoundly change the world. How will it change your classroom? The three things we need to consider when we think about the, the new age, the disruptive technologies that are a constant, uh, you know, that these industries are under constant threat by, and the changing demographics are updating three things what we teach, the content and curriculum, how we teach it by instructional innovation, and third, addressing those out of school, addressing those adult learners who need to reskill and skill up to navigate the constant disruption that uh, they're being felt uh, in the economy. So making sure that we have these three challenges to address is very, very, very important. The answer is easy. We want to migrate from content-centric learning to student-centered learning, where the student is at the center, where the student navigates the difficult problems, and it's not about what the student knows, it's about what the student can do. This is how we need to change our schools. The good news, and while technology is not a panacea, and while technology does not necessarily improve outcomes, these are very important points from my favorite German economist, Andreas Schleicher, and Tony Wagner earlier. The challenge for vendors is working with all of you and working with scholars and universities to figure out what are those interventions that are the most effective. We found that 3D and the maker movement can improve student engagement. It can improve problem solving and collaboration. And thanks to Digital Promise, there's a 77 page qualitative research report that's now available for download. We put 65 learning studios across 15 countries and then added a 66 in the Al Azraq refugee camp in Jordan for Syrian refugees. And we tested what are the most effective project-based learning and challenge-based learning um, uh, issues or interventions from a technology standpoint. And the research is now published. And it's not published by HP, but by a trusted third party. We know that blended learning and the alternate realities are enabled by technology as well as next generation collaboration. We also know that through open education resources and through online learning that vocational modular and technical learning are also enabled by technology. We also know that technology uh, needs to be affordable, accessible, needs to be easily maintained, needs to be tracked, uh, you know, asset tracked, et cetera. And when we combine all these sort of operational issues with all the pedagogic and megatrends issues that we talked about earlier, these combine to fulfill our vision for what we call the classroom of the future. We're across five domains, students, faculty, classrooms, schools, and communities. Technology assists the improvement of learning, economic, and social outcomes for communities across the world based upon primary, 
and secondary schools. But that's not enough. We know that we need to bridge the gap, the gap between the primary and secondary schools and college and career readiness. And to date, there has not been sufficient connection between secondary and tertiary, or primary, secondary, and tertiary. So we've just announced the campus of the future. This is our vision for the next generation higher education campus. You'll see some familiar faces here. Students, faculty, spaces, campuses, and communities. What this does is it sets up our conceptual framework for human capital development. Starting with the, ca ca sorry, starting with the classroom of the future, I'm not sure what I was trying to say there then migrating to the campus of the future, and then finally in the office of the future, or what we call one life, where the boundaries between work and home life, personal life, have been merged. We want to create the conditions where students will succeed in the new economy, students will succeed in the new uh, global world, students will succeed wherever they are, by making students flexible, adaptive, critical thinking collaborators. So, what are we going to do about this, and how do we get to, from point A to point B? Well, HP has uh, humbly started a number of different uh, initiatives in order to support the research, the applied research of technology and education, so that we can get away from those very bad examples in certain countries and certain schools where they throw a bunch of tablets at students and hope something good happens, or they claim that they're in enhanced uh, educational outcomes when there's no quantitative or qualitative uh, study of those outcomes. So what we uh, are announcing over the, over the next couple weeks, uh, and indeed today, uh, is first the HP Applied Research Network. Starting with uh, Yale University, uh, where we worked in secret for the last year uh, on a blended reality study, uh, where we take VR, 3D structured light scanners, the Sprout by HP blended reality workstation, and a number of other of our technologies, and put them into use. For instance, Harvard University, MIT, the University of San Diego, and the University of Pennsylvania will all be looking at how to teach middle school in a more effective and engaging way with VR, AR, and 3D printing. We have Brown University, who I mentioned earlier, who's using VR to establish empathy with their school of art between cultures that might clash. We're working with the London School of Economics, the University of London, to create the classroom of the future specifically for South Africa, mapped to their curricular goals. So what we've done is instead of looked inward at HP Labs, which is a fantastic, unbelievable place uh, to create um, uh, technological uh, innovations and discovery, we applied the research at the world's elite research universities. So again, uh, you'll hear more about this in the next session at Campus of the Future. We've also passed, zoomed past the 100,000 mark in surveys for students, teachers, faculty, and staff at the world's primary and secondary institutions. Whether it's in Bogor, over to the right, whether it's in Oman in the middle, or whether it's in a strange place called South Carolina on the left, uh, we go out and embed into schools, into employers, into communities, and live there. We live there and we bring .org, nonprofit partners with us to make sure that the research that we're doing is valid and then we make informed recommendations to the governments and to the people of these communities about how they can improve the state of human capital in their um, community, in their, in their country, in their state, in their province. So again, over 100,000 uh, surveys completed. We've also created the Education Data Command Center. This uses predictive economics, econometrics, sorry, predictive econometrics that ties educational outcomes to economic and social outcomes. So we can show the relationships, not only today, but tomorrow, 10 years, 15 years down the road, of truancy, whether or not you show up to school, and crime, felony convictions. We can show predictions about net migration, GDP per cap, and even patents granted. And again, this is uh, HPIP um, that we do this. We can set up an education command center where we show ministers of education the past, the present, and the future of their human capital development apparatus. We've also, at the UN, uh, the United Nations General Assembly this year, announced HP School Cloud, a hybrid cloud appliance that's both an access point as well as a server that is designed to serve those communities that don't have persistent internet access. Or when they do have access, they don't have access to the right material or it's too, quote unquote too open. So working with a number of partners to provide open education resources and open 
learning management system and an overall open approach, we're now going to democratize access to basic literacy, numeracy, and problem solving across the world, even when there's no internet access. We mentioned digital uh, Promise Global earlier in our HP Learning Studios uh, project. This is how we test maker movement, PBL, and challenge-based learning in the field. And again, I encourage you to go to Digital Promise's site. We also have been working with the Clooney Foundation for Justice in UNICEF on creating better educational outcomes and a better experience for displaced refugee children from the Syrian conflict. Over the next two months, 30 days, 60 days, something like that, uh, we'll be equipping seven schools in Lebanon uh, with technology and the training for the teachers, access to open education resources, leveraging the UNESCO and the UNICEF frameworks for education. And we're not just going to drop the equipment off, we're going to track and measure how effective it was by using control group and experiential group, so-called A-B testing. We've also created the most successful line of education PCs ever in the history of the world, the HP Education Editions, which are built for schools and designed for learning. Uh, these are bespoke education PCs that are focused on blended learning and also not breaking at the same time and also being very easy to set up. And then finally, we have unleashed a fleet of buses that drive across India to teach science, technology, engineering, and mathematics skills and expose whole new populations to career choices, to technology's possibilities, and meet them where they are in their communities. So again, I want to emphasize a few points. One, HP agrees that technology does not necessarily improve learning outcomes. And our mission is to find out what does and bring it to market to equip all of you to improve the learning, economic, and social well-being of your schools and of your communities. So thanks, and there's my URL. Thank you. <laughs>